This is an ABC podcast. Most of us are familiar with the creatures that live under the sea. We can see what they look like and how they move just by going to an aquarium or by snorkelling or from watching nature documentaries. But this is a really recent thing. For nearly all of human history, it was only sailors that got a glimpse of the strange creatures of the deep. Most people would pretty much only see the fish on their plate, and that was about it. So imagine the impact that the world's first big public aquarium had when it opened in London in the mid-19th century. For the first time, people were exposed to the gangly weirdness of an octopus and to lobsters and sea urchins and a school of fish. John Simons is Emeritus Professor at Macquarie University and he lives in Hobart. John has written about all kinds of things in his distinguished career. He's written about medieval manuscripts, chivalric romance and the history of cricket. More recently, John has dived right into the history of animals, into the lives of the animals that became stars when they were put on display in Victorian England in front of thousands of fascinated gawkers. John's latest book is about the invention of the aquarium in the Victorian era and the craze that it sparked for marine life. And his book is called Goldfish in the Parlour. Hello, John. Hello, Richard. You had been a medievalist for most Mm. of your career. What got you interested in the lives of animals? Well, I was always interested in um, animal welfare and animal rights in in a personal way. And there came a point in my career when I achieved certain things and I realised that I didn't really have to worry too much about publishing in medieval literature anymore. So I thought I'd start writing about the things that I um, I really cared about and that was animal rights and animal welfare. But of course as a historian I do that by telling stories about the history of animals and uh, let, let people understand through that the issues around welfare and so forth that emerge. I've often talked on this program about trying to imagine myself into the life of an animal, you know, just from having a Mm. pet in my Mm. life and how hard it is to do that because we're always inclined to project human attributes onto the animals in our lives. Is that what you were looking at? Were you kind of interested in what might be going on in in a certain animal's head? To a certain extent, although, as you rightly say, it's actually very difficult and actually, you know, often I think quite dangerous to start to make speculations about what animals might or might not think or might or might not feel. I I think it's better to assume that they do think and they do feel and that because of that they have certain certain rights to um, a reasonable treatment. So I, I think I take it from that perspective more. I mean, there, are, there have been some very interesting writings about the inner life of animals, but anthropomorphising them too much is a, is a difficult path to go down. I wonder if we, you know, if we could actually sort of put ourselves inside their heads, given that they have sent a sense of sight that's either mm. radically better or radically worse, a sense of mm-hmm. smell that's radically better or radically worse. We have this wholly, completely different sensory field that would make the world look utterly different, I think, wouldn't it? I'm sure it does. There's been a lot of recent work about octopuses, which are quite extraordinary creatures, and and particularly their their sensory apparatus and their cognitive powers, which appear to be quite different from ours and quite remarkable. When you were looking at some of these star animals mm-hmm. from the Victorian era that I mentioned before, which animal did you start with, John? Well, I started with a wombat called Top, <laughs> who, who was owned by the pre-Raphaelite painter Dante Gabriel Rossetti, who, who in fact owned a whole menagerie of um, exotic animals. Rossetti had a pet wombat? He certainly did. It's called Top, is that right? It's Top. It's called Top after William Morris, yeah. And, and how, how did an English painter, pre-Raphaelite painter, come to be in the possession of an Australian native animal like that? Well, it, it wasn't as hard as you might think, Richard. The East End of London, particularly around the St Catherine Docks area, had a number of traders in um, exotic animals. And sailors, ships captains and tourists would have these animals and they'd bring them. You know, the famous picture of a sailor with a parrot is a good example of that. And then they would sell them uh, to these dealers. 
So Rosetti went down to the East End one day with a £5 note in his pocket and came back with a wombat. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what do you know about the life of Top the Wombat in this garden in, in London? Well, it, it wasn't very long. Most of Rosetti's animals died uh, pretty promptly because he, he had no idea how to look after any of them, really. And Top lived for just a few months. He, he lived in the garden in Chelsea. Uh, he also lived in the house, and there are anecdotes of what he got up to in, in the house. He appears, though, to have had sarcoptic mange, which is... Um, that doesn't sound good. No, no, and it's still endemic in wombats, and, and that probably carried him off quite young. And pro- probably he only lived until he was uh, eight or nine months old, unfortunately, so he was quite a small wombat. What kind of interest did a wombat excite in London in those days? Oh, well, a lot of interest because at about just slightly earlier than, than uh, the arrival of Top, London Zoo had acquired its first, its first wombats and they were um, extremely popular, especially since they bred. So, that, so for the first time, wombats were, were new wombats were appearing in Britain. In the course of the 19th century, I mean, really from the First Fleet onwards, there's a steady trail of Australian animals to England and to uh, Europe, but more, mostly to England. It starts with kangaroos, which are incredibly robust animals and were relatively easy to support, uh, to transport and get them there alive. And there were several groups of kangaroos in England, um, even by the turn of the 19th century. The the most difficult one was the uh, koala, because as you probably know, koalas have a very, very specific diet, and they couldn't keep them alive long enough on fresh eucalyptus leaves as they crossed, as they went on the long sea, I know, the long sea voyage. And um, they finally did get one to, to London Zoo. But unfortunately, he then got tangled up in a towel, in a, in a, in a towel rack in, in, a, in, a, in a lavatory <laughs> and hanged himself. Oh, God. Uh, I know. Um, so... Um, oh, the poor thing. Oh, well, uh, m- most, most of my research is, is rather like that, I'm afraid, Richard. Most of it ends badly for the animals, I'm afraid. Yeah. Which is part of the point of, of doing it, you know? Yeah. I re- remember reading a story that the Habsburg Emperor Rudolf II had this huge menagerie in Prague Castle. He did. And one of them included a cassowary from New Guinea. Now, this is in yeah. the 1500s he had a cassowary. So this has been going on for a while, this, this uh, trade, not yeah. it? There are some strange things. There, there is also um, a, a very early manuscript which clearly has a sulphur-crested cockatoo in it, a uh, European manuscript. I think we underestimate quite how much transaction there was with uh, what we now think of Australia in, in those days. I mean, although at the European end, they weren't quite sure where these things were coming from. You know, there, there, was tran- there were transitions through uh, what is now Indonesia and uh, China, which made their way, which uh, of animals which made their way into Europe. Uh, and there is um, some thought that the, the Chinese had some kangaroos quite early on too. You've also told the story of Obaish, mm. the hippo, mm. a hippo. How did this hippo end up in Victorian London? Yeah, the London Zoo was uh, set up as as basically a private zoological society for members only, and that business model was badly failing by uh, about 1850. So they got in a guy called David Mitchell as what we would now call the CEO, and he hit upon a business model which involved getting what he called a star animal each each year, which would revolutionise the fortunes of the zoo and and bring in many more paying customers. So they mounted an expedition. They uh, did a lot of diplomacy with the government of Egypt and they mounted an expedition down the Nile to capture a hippo and bring it back alive to London. Now, capturing a hippo did. is no small feat. I mean, a hippo, no. hippos don't like you coming too close to them, I understand. And, um, They're extremely dangerous. Extremely dangerous. <laughs> yeah. so, so what do you know about how they caught this hippo? Well, it was very sad. This was, it was only a baby hippo when they captured it. Oh. So, I mean, I'm, I'm afraid what they actually did was shot its mother... And then they um, hooked it with a traditional hippo spear, which is like a boat hook. And in fact, in the in the photo of our in the photos of our boy, you can actually see the scar on his side from the boat hook. And then they um, transported him up the Nile, kept him for a bit to a climate to recover and to wait for the ship to come from England, and took him off to England, where a special train was waiting for him to take him to London Zoo. How long had it been since hippopotamuses were in? Britain. Were they ever in Britain? 
Well, they were in the days when Britain was tropical forests. Yeah, they, they were. They, they were the um, prehistoric hippopotamuses. But it's probable that some of them, the hippos may have been brought to England by the Romans for gladiatorial games that were held in London. In fact, that's probable. But um, none since Roman times. In fact, none in Europe since Roman times. So what was Obias's life like in captivity in London Zoo? Well, he was hugely popular and, and Mitchell's uh, star animal... Um, strategy worked and in the first three months roughly a quarter of a million people came to see him it was, it was huge over the years of his life and he lived for about 20 years over the years of his life you can see them constantly building bigger ponds for him because they didn't quite know enough about hippos to know just how big and fierce a thing a hippo is and they they didn't quite get his nutrition right and uh, I mean I actually found uh, the report of the post-mortem on him and he was undersized for a hippo and clearly had nutritional issues which had caused that undersizing and, and other diseases, actually. One of the things that's suppressed, and, and if you read the zoo's propaganda, as it were, it's kind of all wonderful. And he becomes a kind of pet. You know, Queen Victoria used to go to see him. Charles Dickens went to see him. Everyone <laughs> who was anyone went to see him. But he was actually plainly full of anger and they were making constant efforts to strengthen the oak doors to his pen, to strengthen the bars, because they were terrified of him uh, getting out. And did he ever get out? Did he ever manage he, to escape? He, he got out once. I mean, <laughs> in all the time he was there, he got out once. And... Um, <laughs> Was this in Regent's Park, was it? Yeah, in Regent's Park. So, yeah. so there's a hippo <laughs> rampaging around Regent's Park for a bit, wasn't it, 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 it? Exactly right. And um, <laughs> they they got him back by, um, well, uh, th this is a, s a slightly legendary tale, I mean, but th 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 this is the way the story is told. They got him back that one of the keepers was prepared for a pound to attract our vice's attention, then run like anything into, into our vice's cage and s skip over the wall at the back. Of ice would follow him in, and they would slap the door closed behind him, and that's the story. Uh, and I guess it must have been something like that because I can't see how they would run it in any other way. I wonder. I wonder how they put that to the poor zookeeper. Now, this I is the plan. Waved, I think they waved a pound at him. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think I'd want a couple of pounds for that job, yeah, just quietly. Right. I think. <laughs> so, did he ever have a hippo lady love in his life? Obash? Yes, he, he did. <laughs> she was also uh, captured in, in a very in a very similar way. And they had uh, one child who was called... They, 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 they missexed the, the, the hippo when it was born, so they called her Guy Fawkes because she was born on uh, the 5th of November. But yes, yes, and, and, but they, they didn't get on, really. And they, only, they only bred once, and they had to be kept more or less uh, separate. They used to fight. Given that the capture uh, of a bash was... So it seems to us quite a cruel thing, the, yeah. the killing of, of, of the hippo's mother and the, the harpoon and the, mm -hmm. the transport and the unfamiliar landscape. What did Victorians tell themselves about Obaish and what kind of consideration mm -hmm. an animal like that deserved? Did they think animals had souls, for instance, or were they just kind of biological, mechanical things to their mind? So, some did. Certainly some did. And there were certainly people who were concerned with animal welfare. And, and I would say, actually, you know, the, the Victorian zookeepers um, were good scientists and, you know, it was in their interest to keep their animals fit and well. So they, they really did do their best to keep them in the conditions that they thought would help them to thrive, which, uh, I mean, that best wasn't good enough, but it, it wasn't that they were just mindless showmen, as it were. They, they were. they were serious about what they were doing. It was always interesting to me, the natural affection that can sometimes arise, or very often arises, between humans, or the humans feel when they're in close contact with another animal, oh. and how that kind of overrides whatever the ideology is about what the animal might, e might be and what, it might, what kind of inner life it might have. Yeah, that's right. And, and I think that, you know, the, these animals, and particularly Orbeis, but others too, were constructed as... That they were constructed as being like people. They were, you know, Obice was constructed as a sort of rather grand and grumpy old man, for example. And when when people went to the zoo, and there, and there were even in the nineteenth century in this this time, people who said, you know, why do we have these zoos? Isn't this is just terrible? Why do we keep these animals locked up like this? But more people, I think, went there for um, either scientific education or mostly for entertainment. Your book, Goldfish in the Parlour, is about mm. what happened when. The first big glass aquarium 
mm. was built in London in mm. 1853. Yeah, Can you tell right. me how that aquarium came into being and the effect it had on people in London? Sure. Well, this was another Mitchell star animal thing. I mean, he, he'd, he'd been running the star animals program for a couple of years and he hit upon the idea of... Uh, what was called at that point the fish house. It didn't become the aquarium until later. It was called the fish house. And there had never been such a thing before. But a combination of scientific and technological and economic discoveries and changes came together to make it possible. There were changes in, in glass technology which made plate glass, which was strong enough and clear enough to make viable aquariums. The chemistry of seawater was really understood for the first time and how seawater works was understood for the first time. So various things came together to make it possible in Mitchell's mind to actually keep and display fish. And once he'd built this aquarium, what mm -hmm. creatures did he put in it? Well, the first, the, first, um, the first inhabitants of the London Zoo Aquarium were mainly uh, British freshwater fish and um, the kind of crustaceans and anemones and so forth which you would find in rock pools. So some of the tanks were like the kind of aquarium tanks we now think of as an aquarium tank which you looked into the side of and you could see the fish swimming around and some were more like rock pools and you looked down into them and you could see the lobsters scurrying about and it wasn't until a little bit later that they got um, they, they started to stock with um, sea fish uh, uh, as well because of course the problem with fish is unlike unlike a, a hippo where you can say, you know, you can send off a, a, a squad down the Nile to capture a hippo. It's very hard to capture a specific fish. Mm. You, you kind of get what comes up in the dredge, you know. So they, they could only stock with what they could catch. I mean, freshwater fish are a little bit easier. British freshwater fish are a little bit easier. But, but the, um, the sea fish came in rather randomly. And so what impact did that have when people could actually look properly oh. at a fish in its own environment, swimming about at... at I, eye level, I suppose. Exactly right. Sensation, just as with Obish, um, I think I said, you know, a quarter of a million people in three months, same sort of numbers came to see the fish house. It was like the um, movies, in other words. It was a kind of a visual spectacle that was oh, had hitherto been impossible. That, that's, that's correct. And, and it's, a, it's a point that I make in a number of my books, actually, that, of course, in Victorian London, which is where I largely, which I largely look at, if you wanted to see something, you had to go and see it. There was no other way of doing it. So that's why these huge numbers, uh, this is why these huge numbers turned up. The, the, it, you, you actually had to be there to see it. And did this, this aquarium then lead to the first home aquariums, like the, home, the first home fish tanks? Yes, eventually that uh, and, and the, the reasons why, why, it was, why it was able to come about and the craze for me in science, yeah. I mean, and then the home aquarium movement uh, became uh, an absolute craze. Um, I mean, if you look at the Victorian papers, they say every house has an aquarium. Well, that you know, I've done the sums on this and the numbers, <laughs> and that that can't be right. But but a lot of people did have uh, aquariums of all kinds of s shapes and sizes, from the simple goldfish bowl, or to a simple um, just a jar with a fish in it, to quite elaborate things. Some of which actually in the middle of them had. Bird uh, had glass globes into which which birds were kept. Good so God! The, 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 yeah, the fish would swim around uh, the birds who could go up and down a kind of tube. A, a live below. bird inside inside the aquarium. Yeah, that's wow. right. Uh, so the cage the cage where the bird lived would be under the aquarium, but there would be a tube coming out oh. leading into a glass right. dome, which the bird could <laughs> fly up into. And um, look at all the fish. Strange, you know, the strange experience of seeing a bird <laughs> surrounded by fish. Yeah. I mean. tell, me, tell me about the first octopus tank that was set up at the Crystal Palace in London in the nineteenth century. Yeah, the Crystal Palace. Well, the Crystal Palace set they, they set up an aquarium was set up in the in the in the Crystal Palace, and as with the um, the zoo, you know, people knew that by this time you had to have something special to get people to come. And uh, the special thing in this case was an octopus, which you would think wasn't all that uh, exciting because, you know, the English Channel, the, the octopuses are not rare creatures. But never one had never been exhibited before. And also just at that time the kind of science fiction idea of the, of the evil octopus that grabs you with his tentacles and pulls you down and the you know epic fights between sailors and octopuses was was starting to come to come through in popular culture so although the actual octopus they had was just a small unimpressive little animal um 
it was promoted as this kind of monster of the deep, and again, people flocked to see it. Yeah, I mean, if you haven't seen an octopus before, an octopus it looks incredibly strange, mm. the way it moves. Yeah. It's eight tentacles. Must have been kind of galvanising. We have some idea anyway, as you say, how clever they are now. Mm. How clever were these octopuses at the Crystal Palace Aquarium? Well, one of them was very clever. It, it appears that he, he managed to um, work out that he could get he could get out of his tank and into a neighbouring tank where it could eat some of the fish that lived there. And uh, they noticed that fish were missing, but they didn't know how. And then one one day they actually <laughs> saw the octopus at it, and so they... Uh, what do you mean, at it? <laughs> eat, eating, getting into the other tank and eating fish. <laughs> so... Um, they, well, it, would, um, it would, like, pull itself out of its own <laughs> tank, drop yep. into the fish tank... Have have a lovely dinner and, and then return. Go back, right, yep. go back. right. Yep. Like so, so, left the scene of the crime, so to speak. Yep. So that's pretty clever. <laughs> uh, and I mean, that, that's that's an anecdote which mm. is told by a man called uh, Henry Lee, who was one of the ichthyologists that they uh, employed. I, I guess it's true. O- octopuses have been known to travel about like that. So this kind of, does this lead to a kind of an underwater science fiction, like you say, like Jules Verne's? 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and uh, Victor Hugo's books and, uh, and the like? Well, uh, that's right. In fact, I mean, in fact, you know, the, that, this, this is exactly the, the, the point when these, these were starting to uh, uh, appear. And so the octopus was already a, a figure in, in, in the sort of gothic imagination, as it were. And they're old sea dog's tales of giant squid, which we do know now actually really do exist. Oh, they do, yeah, they, they do. I mean, they're not quite like... The, the tail's tail, but yeah, there are some very, very big squid out there. When, what kind of an interaction did you have with fish that made you think inter- differently about them and set you on this yeah. path from the world of mammals, like uh, well, animals like like top and abyish, sure. to creatures of the sea? Sure. Well, I mean, I've ne- I've never owned an aquarium or kept fish or anything like that or been a been an angler, but I was on holiday in Australia. This is before I came to live in Australia, uh, and I went to Sydney Aquarium. And I went up to one of the big tanks and, and there was a, a, a very large fish called a, a knob-headed wrasse living in it and it came up and it kind of hovered at eye level and, 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 and it was we, we, we looked at each other. And many of my books start with, a, with that kind of encounter that I've had with an animal. And that set me thinking. I mean, this was hmm, 20 years ago. But it set me thinking, and uh, thinking about then, what? What, would you, what was your uh, well, was about the question you had? What, what was the fish doing? What you know? Did it, it? I suppose it for the first time it occurred to me that the fish was intending to do that. A fish could intend to do something and have a kind of personhood, which was worth reflecting on. You know? Yes, I'm looking at the fish, but the fish is looking back too. Cor- mm. Correct, correct. And when I like when I next visited the aquarium after I'd moved to Sydney. I went to the, t- the same tank and the, and the same fish came up and did exactly the same thing. So, I mean, it's probably you did it to everyone or she did it to everyone who, who, who comes. But it, it, it interested me. And and that interest was also combined with, with an appreciation that I had started to form that within the field of animal studies and animal uh, welfare writing and animal history, there was very, very, very little written about fish. So a combination of that experience and that thinking and the fact that I realised there's actually quite an interesting history to be written here led to the fish book. One of the moments I realised animals were looking back at us was when I went to Taronga Park Zoo with my son when he was quite little. He was about yeah. four or five or something. And we went to the gorilla enclosure. Oh, and, and, yeah. and, you know, there's one part on the side there and there's a huge um, perspex panel sort of yeah. embedded in the artificial rock that's around yeah. it. And a bunch of people were standing around looking through this perspex panel at this big silverback yeah. who, did, who did this thing. Uh, he or she suddenly turned, turned their head around and went, huh? sort of looked at yeah. us from a distance of about... 20 metres or something, and then just started barrelling towards the perspex at top speed. Everyone started screaming. The gorilla crashed, like, crash-tackled harmlessly into the perspex and bounced off it as everyone ran away. Wow. Ran away, And my little boy was just standing there going, ha, 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 like that, <laughs> watching the whole thing. Clearly, clearly the gorilla was amusing itself at our expense. And then I thought, well, we're just as much of a spectacle for that creature, except, you know, we can go out and move around. Oh, that, that's right. And it, it's always interesting when you go to a zoo to watch people watching animals because they react quite differently. And, I mean, I know that gorilla you're talking about. And You know um, that gorilla? 
oh yeah, it's, it's okay. He's, he's a good friend, eh? but I, I know the very, I know the very one. And um, he, when 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 he enters, it's quite of interesting because people will be round that perspex screen, and when the silverback comes in, there's often a kind of gasp. You know, there's this great wow moment when this animal appears because it's so magnificent. He also enters the Ankeny Valley because. He's like the other animals, but not like the other animals because he yeah. moves much more like us. He looks more Correct. like us and there's that strong genetic relationship. That's, That's part true. of it too, isn't it, that weirdness? Oh, yeah. Very much so. I mean, if people watching other animals, they might laugh. The gorillas, no, they, they just cause us awe. Podcast. Broadcast. This is Conversations with Richard Feidler. Hear more conversations anytime on the ABC Listen app. Uh, John, you grew up in Tunbridge Wells in England, which might lead an English person to assume you're quite posh. Are you posh? Yeah. Are you very posh? Uh, well, I, I guess I am now, but I wasn't when I, when I started. No, I, I actually grew up in, in social housing and um, I, I kind of um, got into, well, I, my route into the life I, I, I've led came through scholarships. But no, I'm, my, my parents were um, working class people. They both left school at 14. Were they supportive of you and your am- ambitions in that area? Yeah, I mean, there was a limit about what they could do to help me directly, um, but they realised that that I I wasn't quite the the same as uh, some other kids. And, um, yeah, so they did help me. They, I mean, they always bought me books and they um, always took me to... My my interest in history started very, very early, and so they always took me to... um, Places of historic interest, country houses, so where other kids might have wanted to go off to the seaside, I wanted to go and see a castle, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, a lot of English historians I've, I've met over the years have had that experience in their childhood where they suddenly realise that there's a Roman ruin somewhere mm. down the road or mm. some old medieval pile somewhere and mm. th- that sort of sparks the... Im- fires the imagination and it never leaves them. That's, is that you, is it, John, as well? Yeah, I, I think so. And, you know, as, as you suggest, you know, th- this is... These things aren't that hard to find in England. I mean, when, when I lived in Lincoln, I mean, one of the houses that I looked at to buy actually had a Roman temple in the garden. Um, Good God. And that, yeah, and it's not, it's not that unusual. It's unusual to have a Roman temple in the garden, but it's not. It wouldn't be unusual to have a few Roman stones or medieval stones in the garden. You were originally going to become an archaeologist in your mind. Why was that Correct. attractive to you? Uh, well, I, I think it's the. I think it's the same thing. And I mean, of course, you know, because because of how I grew up. I mean, I didn't really have access to understanding what options might be available from the point of view of someone, you know, going to university and that that sort of thing, because there was no one to tell me those things. Archaeology was something that I obviously heard of, probably saw a television program about it or something like that. And um, I, I think it started from there. That was the thing that I thought you could do if you were interested in history, you know. So you went to university to study classical Greek, classical Latin and the like. Tell me what it was that quite properly lured you away from the ancient world towards the medieval world. I, I started, I, I studied classics at school. I mean, my, my, almost my entire education was in Greek and Latin, actually, so I was, I was kind of like a Victorian gentleman already, really. Um, but in my last year at school, when I was applying to university, which, as you say, I was going to go and read classics, I became more interested in the bar- barbarians than the, um, the Romans and the Greeks. Why? Why barbarians? Um, well, I think again, you know, you, you re- I realised suddenly that there was, because you only see these people through the lens of the Ro- the, the, the Romans and the Greeks, and that's usually a, a pretty sort of uh, sullied lens, if I can put it that way. And I suddenly started to realise actually that th- these barbarians really had rather interesting cultures of their own. So, so we're talking uh, about like the early Germanic tribes and the Celtic tribes of Europe. C- c- correct. So that that's exactly right. So so I went to when I went to university, I actually went to read uh, medieval German, uh, Germanic and uh, Celtic languages and uh, spent uh, my undergraduate life, um, you know, re- reading Icelandic sagas, Anglo-Saxon poetry, the Irish sagas and the Welsh heroic poetry. Um, and then 
when I, when I got my first degree, I, I I moved on slightly and and moved into the the higher Middle Ages, and my PhD was actually on uh, 14th and 15th century chivalric romance. Chivalric romance, like these are mm. this was this craze that was there in the high Middle Ages for yeah. chivalry uh, stories of, of romantic stories of chiv- chivalry and yeah. the like. Knights and dragons. Yeah. yeah. So this is like Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, that that kind Could, of thing. Exactly. What yeah. and what was your particular favourite of these chivalric romance stories? So my favourite one was probably a a, a, a really crazy uh, poem called um, Octavian, whereby. Uh, someone who was born into an aristocratic family is lost as a child and is brought up by a butcher. Now, when you say Paris. Octavian, are we? Is this the same Octavian who's the Roman Emperor Augustus, who later becomes called uh, Augustus? Yeah, but the person in, in in question isn't isn't Octavian himself. That's just the title of the romance. But yes, you're you're right. The the history that um, underpins. Uh, 14th century popular romance is, is, is pretty vague, actually. So yeah, what happens in this in this story? Well, so Florent, the boy who's lost, uh, the, the aristocratic boy who's lost, um, is brought up by uh, a butcher in Paris, and um, he tries to teach him the trade and to teach him to be a merchant, but he, he keeps on doing the wrong thing, so he gives him some money to go and buy some uh, provisions in the market, for example, but he comes back with a falcon. <laughs> Uh, and what does that what does that reveal about be, his character? Be, because his na- his natural um, sh- his, his natural tendencies to chivalric behaviour keep coming out. Um, so he's naturally noble then. He's naturally noble, right. and uh, when um, he's he's discovered, as it were, he, he he does some feats of arms, and and the the king invites him and uh, his uh, butcher foster father Clement to a banquet, and. Uh, Clement embarrasses him because he he, he tr- first of all he tries to pay for it for them. <laughs> it's class it's class based comedy really. But Clement tries to pay for them, but then he's worried that he's going to have to pay for everything. So he steals all the coats and says he won't give them back until he makes sure that everyone's paid. <laughs> and this 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 embarrasses Florent tr- terrifically. But he he then is he, he then comes into his own and is recognised for the the aristocratic hero that he is, and it all ends. It all ends happily. This is a common thing in the Middle Ages. Like uh, several times, I've encountered what was known in the Middle Ages as the Alexander Romance, mm. which is this strange retelling of the life of Alexander the Great, mm. which bears no resemblance to his real life, but has him performing like the like the historical Alexander these incredible feats. Like on one occasion, Alexander the Great is able to save his city of Alexandria by thwarting these sea monsters that keep attacking it because he, he yeah. gets in a glass diving bell, goes down to the bottom of the Mediterranean, <laughs> sketches the monsters, comes to the surface, says, we're going to build these metal replicas of the monsters. Mm. The monsters come out of the sea, they get scared off, and that's, thus Alexandria is saved. So the Middle Ages, they knew there were these great people in times gone by, but then invented these whole other stories about it. The, the, I mean, there is, of course, a parallel um, industry going on in much more serious history um, and and so on. So um, th- th- their history wasn't entirely lost. But, yeah, I mean, th- there's a popularised version of it of it too, which, um, well, like popular history today doesn't necessarily... is more interested in a, in a good story than in what the realities may or may not have been. You're seeing manuscripts of these stories, like the story of Octavian or Sir Gawain and the Green Knight mm. and, the, and the like. What happens to them as they're copied and passed from hand to hand? Do they change as they go from one version to another? Yeah, they do, in some cases, quite dramatically. I mean, there are two versions of Octavian, for example, which are quite different. And this seems to be a a function of a number of things. It it can be uh, the way in which a new manuscript has been commissioned and maybe someone has a particular interest, so the the text is altered to fit that. But it's mostly because of what a scribe is doing. And, and And although we think of a scribe as someone who just copied the thing down, in fact, the scribes had a more authorial relationship with the text that they worked with there's no doubt that scribes change things because they 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 thought that they could put put something better in or they didn't like what they read and so they changed it Um, and they made mistakes as well so you you see texts in which you know names change for example because the scribe has forgotten uh, is (laughs) has gone on to automatic pilot john in the 1990s you were sent into eastern and central europe after Mm. the fall of communism. Mm. Tell me about your mission, what you were doing there. Well, I did a number of um, consultancy jobs, uh, mainly for for the British Council, but also for what was then called the European Economic Community, to help uh, universities in various um, of the former communist states to 
reconnect with the international academic communities, in particular through the way that they thought about their curricula and the way that they uh, taught their students. What had things been like before the fall of communism in these universities? Um, well, highly, um, a highly determined curriculum, determined, of course, by, depending on which country you're in, I mean, some were more... Um, controlling than others but a, a, a curriculum that's ultimately determined by by the party and the um the the, the party representatives within uh the university the ruling um, ideology mm. uh, the ruling ideology and the um you know the, the absolutely absolute primacy and unchallengeability of marxism leninism did they have anything like could they have anything like modern history in, in such places i wonder because the history you'd teach in the, you know, in, in what would have been well, the Charles University in Prague, for example, mm. would have had to have been nonsensical to a, avoid the. I mean, they'd have to talk about the Soviet invasion of '68 being like fraternal assistance from. Oh, yeah, that's what they did. That kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what what they did. I mean, the other uh, feature of most of these universities was um, an absolutely rigid hierarchy from the the prof at the top down to the the lowly undergrads at the bottom, and. Um, that there was very little uh, interaction, and the, the you know our, our notion that it's actually quite interesting to find out what your students think, and to ask them to talk about what they think, uh, is is a very important part of our education. And their education uh, was pretty foreign in many of those countries. Why, why would you want to know what your students think? Going into the Balkan regions, you know, mm. what the former Yugoslavia made up of, you mm. know, Croatia, Slovenia, Serbia, mm. uh, Montenegro, and all the like. Mm. You would have been going in there at a time when that was about to break up or was breaking up and war was about to break out. Did you were, you... were you seeing all that happening around you? Well, yeah. Um, uh, and Albania as well. I did several jobs in Albania. I started to feel that I was a bad omen, actually, because wherever I went, a war broke out. Um, but my only uh, direct... My direct experience of, of, of something like that was actually in Albania when I... Because I was in Albania when what was... They, it was a kind of civil war broke out. There's a big square in the middle of Tirana, Skanderberg Square, which is like Red Square, or you know, and um, it started to fill with people. And my hotel overlooked that square, and I was looking out of my from my balcony. But I thought I've got to go and see this. It's not every day you see a country breaking up. So I, I went down and, and mingled with the crowds for a bit. One of the things that I've learnt, and and I had previously experience of this in Zimbabwe back in 1982 is that these things can be quite localised. So you can have quite a lot of shooting going on in one part of a city and in another part of the city people are sitting at pavement cafes eating eating their croissants the same as they would on any other day. It's, it's, it's quite remarkable. Were you a religious person before you started going into Eastern Europe? No. No, not at all. Well, I say not at all. I mean, I, I was christened as an Anglican, as most English people of my generation were. My family didn't go to church regularly. Uh, you know, if if anyone got married, it would be in a church. If anyone got born, they would be christened in a church. But that was about it. And how did that change after repeated visits mm. to Eastern Europe? Well, I think it was in 1992, which was my first visit, and it was to... Um, no, it was 1990, my first visit, which was to Bulgaria. They, they ran what they'd hoped was going to be a, an international conference, but in fact only two Westerners turned up, one, and one of them was me. And... Um, the Union of Scholars and Scientists in Bulgaria presented me with an icon as a present, which I liked, because, of course, as a medievalist, I knew a little bit about icons, not not, not much, but a little bit. And um, I took that home and uh, sat it on, you know, sat it on a little easel that I bought for it. Then over the years, as, as I went... Uh, because I was going two or three times a year by this time, after 1990, um, I would buy icons. And then when I was in Belgrade once and I was looking at the icons in the old cathedral there um, and suddenly I realised that I, I I was meant to be an Orthodox Christian and it was just as simple as that. It was black and white, uh, just like a, 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 um, a radio message coming on into my head. Was it an epiphany or was it more like a logical logical conclusion? Oh, no, no, it was, it was a religious experience of the kind that I wasn't used to having. So it wasn't something which could be ignored. Um, I thought about it for a bit, came home and um, started to, you know, consider what, what to do with it. Eventually I had to say to my wife, you know, about this experience and to say, well, um, I'm uh, going to convert to Orthodox Christianity. You know, it's a pretty strange thing to say. What did she and, say? And she said, well, 
funny you should say that because I've been having these thoughts about that too. I mean, it's really weird because she she had a different exposure to orthodoxy from me because she she in those days or she had been a uh, a book illustrator and she had uh, done a contract to illustrate a book which involved living in Greece for six months in the late 70s. So she had had a lot of exposure to orthodoxy through that route. And so um, between us, we um, took the steps to be received into the church. Uh, we got married again, and uh, we still are we, we're still in church every week. So you had an orthodox wedding after being married for however many years? After having been married for, um, oh, let me think, about 17 years, yeah, we had an orthodox wedding. And what was the wedding like? Oh, big, fat and Greek. <laughs> it was uh, no, it was one, it was wonderful because you know when we first got married, you know I, I was in my first job and 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 um, Katie had actually only just graduated and was uh, you know just doing some fairly junior sort of clerking work while she was thinking what to do and so we didn't have any money so we had a very you know modest wedding and that suited us fine for then but um, you know by that time we were a bit better set so we thought we might as well have a have a really good big wedding and we did. I've only attended an Orthodox service, well, probably once, and mm. sort of I tried to get in one in, in see one in, in Rome, actually, weirdly enough, but um, it was mm. packed, so I had to sort of stand and listen to it out, outside. Mm. And the thing that struck me most about it was well, how, how beautiful it was and yeah. how much music there was, how much sort of powerful, swelling, beautiful music there was in, yeah. in the liturgy. What, what, is it, what is it for you about the Orthodox service that you love? Well... I wouldn't want to give the impression that, you know, it's it's all, for me, it's just about the, the music and the icons. You know, for me, it actually, there's a faith component, which, and, and you know, for me, the world and my part in it is, it is explained very fully by Orthodox Christianity. Um, but the real thing about the Orthodox service, which, as you say, is, is a feast for the ears and the eyes and the, the nose as well, because, of course, we use a lot of icon, uh, a lot of uh, incense, um, is that... Um, everything you need to know is in the services. So you're being taught, if you listen to the services, you don't need to read theology, you don't need to study, uh, you're being taught everything. I mean, in, in our stand, standard su Sunday liturgy, for example, there are 212 textual quotations from uh, the Bible. So you're, you're, you're hearing this all the time, you're being taught the faith. Um, uh, you don't have to uh, be a scholar, you don't have to be an intellectual to understand that. And then that's reinforced. You can see the pictures of the feasts and the saints on the walls of the church. You can hear the um, the words of, of, of the liturgy. Uh, you can join in if you want, or you can just listen. What effect does it have on you at the end of it? Well, I, I have quite an active role in the liturgy because for many years I've been a chanter. And um, I'm now uh, a, a, a clergyman, so I actually have various roles to play. You know, I'm actually, I'm actually working in, in church as well. I mean, the first thing, of course, is that um, one steps out of things when, when during the, you know, the, in, in, a, in the liturgy, you're in a very particular time and space, which is not the same as the time and space you usually inhabit. And um, you are partaking of a, of a much bigger, a much bigger reality than the one that you usually live in. Um, you know, and that's... That's no small thing to experience on, on a day-to-day -day basis. The thing that always struck me about the Orthodox service is it seems to be so much about trying to make you feel like you're very close to heaven. Well, that, that's right. I mean, you know, um, one, one could say that um, what we do in the liturgy um, is to construct, to, con to construct a gateway between earth and heaven to, to actually bring... Uh, and we believe, you know, that the church fills with angels at a certain point in the service, for example, and, and, and so on. And um, uh, someone once described going to an Orthodox liturgy, I think it was Dalrymple in the, um, his rather wonderful travel book, To the Holy Mountain, mm. uh, as uh, like spending a leisurely, a leisurely afternoon in one of the outer courts of heaven. And I kind of quite like that. The Orthodox church is so embedded in what we understand of the Middle Ages. You know, mm. It was founded by Emperor Constantine mm. and uh, in Constantinople, which is now Istanbul and, mm. and the like. Does this all of a piece, do you think? Uh, is, it, is it very satisfying for, for someone who's been a medievalist to be part of that kind of a world? Oh, yeah, a a absolutely. And, um, I mean, for example, uh, two or three weeks ago, um, we had a, uh, a particular 
um, service in which uh, a, a, a dish called koliva, which is a kind of porridge, it's a buckwheat porridge, everyone has a spoonful at the end. And um, the origin of that ritual dates back to the year 430. And I think it's amazing that we do these things that have been, you know, continually, we, the, the, that's been continuous since that time. And um, to participate in such old, you know, some of the the, um, the, the liturgical texts that we say every week are, are, are very, very old. I mean, some of them, even St. Basil the Great uh, said that they were old when he came across them. So um, the, um, the continuity, I think, between us and the past... Um, and we still mention some of the Byzantine emperors and empresses in in some of our um, in a, in some of our liturgical texts when we remember particular things that they did. So there's a there's, there are great continuities which are rather wonderful. I think we live in an increasingly secular society where mm. um, increasingly uh, people have no uh, mm. uh, disaffected for whatever reason from mm. from the church. Do you feel more alienated from the society you live in once you fully embrace something like orthodoxy? Um, no, personally, I don't actually. I mean, I think I think some people do, um, but personally, I, I don't. I think personally, I mean, what I see is actually it, it helps me make more sense of things, um, because we do live in the world, you know. And unless you're going to be a monk, uh, you, you live in the world, so you you have to um, engage with the world in 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 the terms that um, it offers you and the terms that you can manage it. Um, I think what orthodoxy does for me is offer me a framework into underst- into understanding that interaction. Does this affect your insights into the lives of animals? I think I suppose that what I already thought about them coheres quite well with the orthodox worldview anyway. And um, Do you think they have souls? Personally, I do, but it's not revealed, so that, that's just an opinion. But I think, as, as one of the Psalms says, the, the righteous man regards the life of his animal. That seems to be pretty unambiguous to me. Does it help you delight in animals? Yeah, yeah, because I mean, obviously, as as as, a, as an Orthodox Christian, I believe that the world was created, and uh, that creation is 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 suffused with, with with the traces of divinity. So yeah, it does. John, it's been fascinating speaking with you, a man with such wide and varied interests and passions. It's such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for asking me. I've enjoyed it very much. Professor John Simons is the author of Goldfish in the Parlour: The Victorian Craze for Marine Life. I'm Richard Feidler. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations with Richard Feidler. For more Conversations interviews, please go to the website abc.net.au slash conversations. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.